Good afternoon, and thank you very much indeed, everyone who has come to this. Um, High Commissioner, our five co-hosts, Brazil, Burkina Faso, France, Italy, Timor-Leste, Excellencies, welcome to our panel on the death penalty, poverty, and the right to legal representation. This afternoon, after opening remarks by the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the, the co-hosts will each say a few words, and then we will have a panel discussion. Last Saturday, I happened upon, I came across something that almost perfectly encapsulates the impetus and the message behind this afternoon's event. It was two tweets by the noted death row campaigner, Sister Helen Prejean, author of Dead Man Walking. They weren't, first one was this, capital punishment means them without capital gets the punishment. And the second one was, the death penalty is a poor person's issue. In the end, it's the poor who are selected to die in this country. You'll never find a rich person on death row. Now, there's a, a brutal and breathtaking truth in what she said. And there have, of course, been major positive developments towards the universal abolition of the death penalty with 160 countries having either abolished it or else stopped carrying them out. On the other hand, where executions are still carried out, they disproportionately affect the poor, while those who can afford good legal representation are fortunately spared. So it's my honor to give the floor first to the, our new High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet. She is also at this event representing the Secretary General who, like her, is a long, has long been a staunch, a staunch supporter of, of the movement against the death penalty and sent his deep regrets that he cannot be here right now. High Commissioner, you have the floor. Thank you, Andrew. Distinguished ministers, excellencies, colleagues, and friends. Um, when I took up my functions as High Commissioner for Human Rights on the 1st of September, one of the first invitations that I gladly accepted was to open this panel on death penalty and poverty. I take this opportunity to thank the member states sponsoring the event, Italy, Brazil, Burkina Faso, France, and Timor-Leste. As I considered the issue of the death penalty, I reflected on a sequence of issues. I would like to share this sequence with you because it creates an essential context. First, Member states adopted the 2030 Agenda in 2015. The Sustainable Development Goals are a global vision for peace, for human rights and development. Their essence is drawn from human rights, the rights to education, health, adequate housing, and much more. The Secretary General has made the SDGs a top priority, and the UN is working with member states to reform the development system to this end. Second, some elements essential to the success of the SDGs lie beyond development alone. To truly leave no one behind, development action must be underpinned by the rule of law. Member states, including national municipal authorities, need to rely on a suitable body of law and justice to apply the decisions on po to apply the human rights standards that are at the core of the SDGs. Law guides the decision on policies and budgets that will drive implementation of the SDGs. Justice system provides accountability to ensure the law is applied correctly and recourse when it's not. To benefit from the SDGs and escape poverty, everyone, but particularly the very poor, must be able to rely on the rule of law. Third, when we say the rule of law, we mean human rights. In preparing for the position for the High Commissioner, I reread the 1993 Vienna Declaration on Human Rights, that led to the establishment of this office. And the declaration made clear that UN action on the rule of law is human rights based. And it called for UN, UN's human rights office to coordinate a comprehensive program for the rule of law. Fourth, there is no more heart-rending example of the failure of the rule of law than when inequity in justice system is compounded by poverty to expose people to the ultimate injustice of the death penalty. International human rights law calls for the abolition of the death penalty because it considers the penalty itself a violation of rights. But international human rights law also opposes 
the inequity in the death penalty application. So there is no question that while the death penalty continues to exist, there will always be errors of abuse or its application. In conclusion, at its most specific, the subject that has brought to us here today is about individuals around the world whose poverty makes them specially vulnerable to injustice generated by failures in justice system and the rule of law. At its broadest, the issue is about achieving the high quality of global development promise in the SDGs. It about ensuring that the rule of law is grounded in human rights. It is about our respect for humanity and for ourselves. If we were unable to guarantee that the poor will receive justice when their very lives are at risk in the context of the death penalty, how can we hope to provide the rule of law foundation needed to achieve the SDGs? And so in opening this panel, I appeal to member states, help us ensure that the rule of law underlies the 2030 agenda and the UN development system. Help us ensure that multilateral action on the rule of law is human rights based as envisioned by you in Vienna a quarter century ago. Help us progress towards moratoriums and eventual, eventual abolition of the death penalty with stronger just, justice system to protect all human rights. We call on all states to demonstrate their commitment to the universal abolition of the death penalty. The UN Human Rights Office opposes the use of the death penalty in all circumstances. I commend again the member state taking the lead on this issue and thank our distinguished panelists who will share their experience with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, High Commissioner, for those powerful points, um, which will guide our discussions. I would now like to give the floor to the various co-sponsors um, and invite them to come to the podium. I, I might suggest maybe we don't need to applaud them all, but since we have so many speakers during the course of the, the, the afternoon. But the first one would be the Foreign Minister of Italy. Italy has been has very kindly uh, contributed financially to the holding of this meeting. Sir. Thank you. Is it uh, okay? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, High Representative, organizers. This uh, meeting for Italy is um, of greatest importance. We very much support uh, all initiatives all around the world, and notably here inside the UN organization, uh, uh, to uh, eliminate, eradicate the death penalty from uh, any kind of legislation and uh, implementation. We are firmly committed to that kind of goal. This is something that is part, uh, really part of uh, our legal culture in Italy. Let's just quote the very well-known uh, work of uh, Cesare Beccaria back in the 18th century, a period where the death penalty and even uh, worse practices were part of the legal system all around the world. Uh, the, the great duchy of Tuscany in uh, the middle of the 19th century had the first legislation not providing death penalty for a criminal uh, uh, for criminal action and uh, in um, in the first uh, criminal code uh, of unified Italy and uh, again of the 19th century the death penalty was no more there uh, the death penalty was reintroduced and not by case in Italy during the fascist uh, dictature. And this uh, creates immediately a link between this penalty and the lack of, um, of freedom and legal protection for, uh, for people. Uh, since the end uh, of the Second World War with uh, the, the Code of uh, the Republic of Italy, the death penalty was um, no more provided and we have even dropped uh, in the 90, in the year 90s of, of the last centuries, the death penalty from, uh, from the, um, the military court. So I think uh, for once uh, our country has uh, really given uh, a, a sort of good example that we very much uh, encourage everyone to follow. It is uh, very well known that many European countries have maintained the death penalty for a long time, even uh, uh, during uh, the last uh, centuries and after the Second World War. The three elements mentioned in the title of this conference, death penalty, poverty, 
and the uh, right to legal representation are interconnected. They represent a sort of uh, ideal triptych of uh, action and line to action to be, to be undertaken. There is, uh, and this is uh, very bad, there is a strict link between poverty, between the lack uh, of uh, a right to legal representation for everybody, and the death penalty. The death penalty is uh, frequently used against people who are not able to defend themselves. And this is very much uh, part uh, of what is wrong with this kind of irreversible pain and, uh, and, uh, and act uh, of human being against other human being. No one uh, has the right to kill somebody else in whatever kind of legal or illegal situation. We have to bear that in mind and to incorporate that in our uh, legislation. The rule of law, which is frequently mentioned as a sort of weapon to put pressure on country, when we uh, consider this kind of rule still present in many legislation, shows how uh, the humanity can uh, uh, really make a step forward uh, towards a better inclusive society which sees the pain always as a remedy uh, to bring also uh, the guilty person to, 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 to understand what wrong was done and uh, to uh, maybe to start or to have, uh, if possible, a sort of new life even after the horrible crime which can bring in many legislation people to that penalty. So we are very much convinced that these uh, should be uh, following uh, the resolution of the UN in, back in uh, uh, 2007, one of the main goal uh, for all of us and that if we keep united engaged even more than what we have done until now the number of uh, countries which support this initiative has increased over the years we can really reach an important goal and give uh, uh, all our nation the sense uh, of a full humanitarian system of law, which doesn't mean that we do not have to punish those who are guilty of uh, horrible crimes, but we have not the right to uh, take their life out. We are not the right to risk irreversible mistake in uh, legal judgment uh, via a penalty which by definition is a definitive one. So this is our convincement uh, as a uh, government uh, for the time being. This is our convincement even stronger as a nation and as a people. This is what uh, Italy, via my words, encourage uh, all of us uh, to, to do as a joint action to uh, improve uh, the overall situation all around the world. Thank you very much, and I very much hope that this occasion will bring us good reflections towards the common goal. Thank you. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you so much, Excellency. Um, I, I just wanted to note, I meant to say before, that the High Commissioner has to leave. I won't say unfortunately, because it's another very important event that our office is organizing. Um, I now give the floor to the Foreign Minister of Timor-Leste, Excellency. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Excellency Madame Michelle Bachet, High Commissioner for Human Rights, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> uh, allow me first of all to say that I won't be staying until the end of this uh, meeting, uh, as I have another meeting uh, coming up. <laughs> But uh, it is a great pleasure and privilege for me to be here representing the government of Timor-Leste on this major occasion and also co-host this important event. This event reminds us again of the importance of the abolition of death penalty and fighting poverty and inequality. Death penalty has been the subject of competing trends in recent years. An ever greater number of countries have now abandoned capital punishment. Out of 193 UN member states, approximately 160 have abolished the death penalty or introduced a moratorium in law or practice. 
At the international level, progression towards abolition was reflected in the adoption of the sixth biennial General Assembly resolution on a global death penalty moratorium in December 2016, which was supported by 117 of the 193 member states, showing growing support for a moratorium. On the other hand, the threat of terrorism and measures to address drug trafficking has led some countries to consider reintroducing capital punishment. In the meantime, increasing concern over capital punishment being imposed on citizens abroad, including from countries which themselves apply it vigorously, has been seen at a global level. Ladies and gentlemen, as prompted by the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals, the link between poverty and the death penalty was another issue attracting increased attention at the international level. The people on death row were found to belong to the economically vulnerable section of the population, and most had not completed secondary education. Poor migrant workers are, mostly like, are most likely to receive a death sentence, according to Amnesty International. Countries that retain the death penalty should progressively move towards abolition by establishing a moratorium, by reducing the number of crimes attracting the death penalty and by improving conditions on the death row. At the minimum, death sentences could be employed for the more serious offenses, offenses and are there to pro procedural safeguards, safeguards as laid out in international law. The 2030 agenda in, the, in, in, in particular the SDG 16 devoted to governance exp explicitly recognized the importance of good governance and sp specifically aims at advances in democracy, shared prosperity, the rule of law, peace, human rights, inclusion, and gender equality. It commits governments to providing access to justice for all and building effective, accountable, and inclusive institutional at all levels. The global commitment to leave no one behind in implementing the SDGs must not exclude people on trial for crimes that carry the death penalty, ensuring access to quality legal representation should be the entitlement of all citizens. Timor-Leste is a democratic country, upholding the principles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to all citizens are equal before the law, and is aware of the linkage between poverty and the shortfalls in legal representation. The right to a person's life needs to be guaranteed and protected first and foremost. Timor-Leste's constitution, Article 28.3 states that there is no death penalty in the Democratic Republic of Timor-Leste. Ladies and gentlemen, Timor-Leste ratified the second additional protocol to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights to abolish moratorium death penalty. We advocated legal assistance for vulnerable peoples before and during the trial. Death penalty is inextricably linked to poverty, social and economic inequality status, which affect access to justice for those who are sentenced to death for several reasons. Defendants may lack resources such as social and economic, but also political power to defend themselves, and will in some cases be discriminated against because of their social status. Everyone has the right to life as much as the right to justice advocacy. Ladies and gentlemen, Timor-Leste continues to develop its legal institutions and processes alongside the Timorese traditional justice system. The justice sector plays a crucial role in building and laying the foundation to consol consolidate peace and stability and to guarantee that the rule of law that plays a vital part in our society in post-conflict circumstances. Despite being faced with various obstacles, Timor-Leste is attempting and working to develop and strengthen its justice sector to make justice a reality for all, without exception. Today, an estimated 1.1 to 1.2 five million Timorese are served by a legal process, progress, which is being implemented by our court system that consists of four district courts and one court of appeal, including an independent prosecution service and a public defender's office created alongside district offices. Before end, ladies and gentlemen, let me emphasize that it is important to acknowledge that death penalty remains one of the obstacles that all nations need to consider abolishing in order to respect the rights of each human being and to end the violation of a basic right and human dignity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Excellency.
I, I now give the floor to the, um, to the Foreign Minister of, of Burkina Faso. And um, I, can I remind speakers maybe to, to limit to three minutes would be appreciated. Dear President, dear uh, panelists and uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure uh, for my country to be part of that high-level event uh, regarding uh, death penalty, uh, the rights and the uh, rights to be represented uh, legally. And uh, it doesn't have to be uh, demonstrated regarding the necessity to uh, provide the poorest people and the most vulnerable people to have uh, legal uh, assistance. Uh, the uh, rule of law and the um, law institutions uh, have enough uh, resources, and these are the priorities for the government of my country. So there were several uh, reforms that were uh, launched to uh, make sure that uh, the citizens have access to justice and uh, in order to implement uh, the um, uh, penalties uh, that are, would be more uh, adequate. The Burkina Faso has been for 30 years an abolitionist country. And uh, through the non-execution of uh, people who were condemned to death uh, since 1988. And my country hasn't stopped uh, um, to uh, support all the resolutions of the General Assembly of the uh, United Nations. And uh, Mr. D uh, D uh, Director General and Mr. D the the will, the very strong will of Burkina Faso to uh, abolish uh, the death penalty is progressively on the legal plan uh, um, translated by um, by one uh, law regarding torture and assimilated practice. Also, the adoption by the National Assembly of Burkina Faso of the new penal code of May 31st of 2018 completes the journey of my country towards the application of more human sentencing. Major evolutions that uh, took place in this uh, code are provisions of the abolition for death capital and the centralization of the uh, criminal provisions and international engagements in Burkina Faso. This code makes available to the legal world a working instrument compliant with the aspirations of our people. Ultimately, the draft of our new constitu constitution that has already been debated and arrived to a consensus in the political stipulates an Article 5, Line 2, that nobody can be sentenced to the penalty. The adoption of this new constitution is going to bring uh, more uh, protection to the right to life in our country. The, the poorest people uh, face a lack of legal aid that can uh, bring a risk of the application of death penalty. This is why the justice in my country has always uh, has always made possible for poor people to have uh, legal access to legal aid, the aid they need to defend their uh, their rights through a commission of mm -hmm. lawyers. The funds for the legal aid uh, have increased uh, year to year. Failing to uh, get a complete abolition in all states, it's necessary to ensure the right uh, of defense to all vulnerable people, and this will minimize the risk of application of applying the death penalty. It is also important to call on to the international community to join all necessary efforts for the right to respect to life. Like Eugene Vidoc said, uh, the death penalty is an immoral sentencing. It's useless because it, uh, it makes people used to the spec uh, show of ordeals and it doesn't repair anything because unfortunately, the death of the killer does not bring back the victim to life. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. I give the floor to the, thank you very much, Excellency, the Minister from Brazil. Thank you.
Firstly, I would like to thank the Italian government and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights for organizing this important event. Brazil attaches great importance to actions that aim at contributing to the death penalty moratorium. Under the Brazilian Constitution, the death penalty is prohibited. Furthermore, we have ratified important human rights treaties that address this issue, and we have been traditionally engaged in initiatives under the auspices of the United Nations that seek to restrict the application of this penalty in light of the principle of human dignity and the right to life. Brazil's engagement in this matter is further reaffirmed by the fact that we are currently acting as a negotiation facilitator for the resolution on the moratorium on death penalty, which will be discussed this October in the third committee. The last General Assembly resolution addressing this subject, adopted in December 2016, welcomed the global progress towards the abolition of the death penalty, encouraged by the adoption of a moratorium of this sentence, and urged states to establish safeguards to protect the rights of those facing capital punishment. With the spirit of moving forward in, the, in this theme, I invite all participants in this event to join efforts with Brazil for, for approving of this year's resolution. Capital punishment is a blatant human rights violation, which is incompatible with more than just the principle of human dignity. As indicated by the proponents of this event, the application of this penalty has a disproportional impact over the poorest, and I shall add, over racial, ethnic, and religious minorities, as well as LBGTI, which often are deprived of means to afford judicial and administrative costs of their defense when they are not deprived of free and unimpeded access to governmental institutions. Given how the death penalty is an irrevocable punishment, one cannot ignore the risks of its application to innocent people who might be incapable of defending themselves properly due to socioeconomic factors that go beyond their will. Should we ignore this risk, we would be neglecting the vicious cycle through which social marginalization increases the possibilities of criminal condemnation. The application of irreversible punishment as the death penalty only worsens this cycle, thus contributing to the situation of vulnerability of marginalized social groups. Moreover, the most vulnerable are precisely those who living, whose living standards we are trying to improve with the sustainment, Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. We agree then with the proponents of this event when they state that the achievement of the SDGs necessarily entails the guarantee of equal access to justice, which cannot be achieved with the application of the death penalty to people who do not have adequate legal representation and who are often condemned based on discriminatory grounds. We urge states that still apply this form of punishment to join efforts for a universal moratorium on the death penalty, aiming at its complete abolition. We also urge states that still apply this sort of punishment to make all possible actions so that everyone without discrimination of any kind can have their right to adequate and effective representation assured. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. And now I call on the Minister of State from France. Bien, mesdames, mesdames. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, honorable ministers, excellencies, you, we all have in our literature uh, people who have uh, marked this. I'm going to the site now and a French author who I think uh, touches the universal with, uh, and it is Albert Camus. Albert Camus, uh, you know, the author of The Foreigner, L'Etranger, a novel uh, where that uh, talks about the absurd, uh, afterwards wrote some reflections on death penalty. And he shares uh, a thought that I wish to share with you right now. He says, 
uh, death penalty would not uh, intimidate a criminal. That means that it is powerless in most cases. I think that uh, this uh, struggle, abolitionist struggle, that uh, has been carried on for decades by many people, uh, we need to perpetuate it. And uh, this today is the occasion to say again how the death penalty is an inhuman, inefficient, and unfair uh, punishment. And when this uh, unfair punishment affects uh, disproportionately the most vulnerable, then there's a double injustice. We know uh, people are not uh, the same equal in front of the justice. They don't all have the possibility uh, to uh, have uh, legal aid like they exist, for instance, in France. And this uh, La, uh, the disequilibrium in access to the justice uh, can translate itself to a more fundamental inequality that can uh, have uh, for consequence the loss of life. So this argument in itself should be enough to persuade us, for those to ne who need to be persuaded, how the death penalty is a violation of human rights. So uh, last uh, 10 of October, uh, during the uh, the Global Day Against the Death Penalty. France organized with the civil society a day on this subject, uh, on uh, death penalty and poverty. Because for us, the fight against the, uh, against the death penalty also joins the fight against poverty, a subject that President Macron uh, talked about this morning in front of the General Assembly, and that uh, is uh, along with the presentation of France for a resolution on extreme poverty. So when we are going, now that we're going to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the Declaration of Human Rights, it is more than ever necessary to uh, stay mobilized for this, uh, for the abolition of uh, death penalty. France encourages the states who haven't done it yet to bring their vote at the Assemb General Assembly in favor of a universal moratorium. And I wish to congratulate my colleague from Burkina Faso because, uh, like he just said, it, the country abolished. Uh, uh, last uh, June 1st, that, uh, the, the death penalty. So this is uh, uh, one more step forward, and I hope that uh, there will be uh, more step forwards so that this injustice ends. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Mer to the panel part of the discussion, we have four exceptionally um, qualified panelists today, and each will speak for up to seven minutes, and, and then we, we will then have a discussion after that. Um, I'd like to start with um, Professor Philip Alston, who is currently the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty. But before that, from 2004 to 2010, he was the Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial and Summary Executions. So I believe he's a, a uniquely well-placed to speak on the links between poverty and the death penalty, which is, of course, our theme for today. So, Professor Alston. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Assistant Secretary General. Um, it's a, a great uh, pleasure to be here and to be able to address uh, this important set of issues. Um, I don't think we really need to spend much time on establishing the links between poverty and the death penalty. There was a famous South African case very soon after the fall of apartheid where the Constitutional Court uh, held that the death penalty was unconstitutional. And one of the principal reasons for that was that people who don't have significant resources were far more likely at every stage of the criminal process uh, to become candidates for execution. There have been reports from a number of countries, most recently uh, an important Indian report, reports from Nigeria and elsewhere. But it's also worth noting that there are not actually a lot of studies undertaken which document in any great detail the extent to which socioeconomic 
class or status is actually directly linked to the death penalty. I can certainly say that from my own experience as Special Rapporteur on executions uh, that I rarely ever encountered cases involving people with wealth. Uh, there are, of course, situations where political enemies are subject to the death penalty in some regimes, and the apartheid regime was the perfect example of that. But otherwise, the death penalty has a big sign on it saying, reserved, reserved for the poor for those who cannot buy their way out of arrest in the first place, those who cannot afford legal representation to argue their case, those who cannot afford a decent appeal, and those who simply hold no weight in the eyes of the government of the day. So they're perfect candidates for execution. I think it's extremely important for us to be pushing this dimension uh, that the death penalty is, apart from anything else, uh, illegitimate simply because of the extent to which it is based on wealth versus poverty. However, we also need to inject a small negative note into the debate and acknowledge that there's an overriding reason why the argument of the link between the death penalty and poverty is not winning the day automatically. And the answer, of course, is that poverty plays out in the same way in relation to most civil and political rights. Uh, the poor are far more likely to be tortured, far more likely to be subjected to police brutality far more likely to be raped by security forces. I remember one particular country that I visited as rapporteur when the police were suddenly horrified to discover that one of the many people they had killed was the son of a prominent politician. That was a big mistake and they would never have intended it had they known. They much prefer to execute poor people who can't defend themselves. In closing, I would only want to draw attention to the relative lack of attention that is given to poverty itself in the human rights area. Poverty does lead to a violation of most other human rights. But in a world that is dominated by neoliberal economic policies, where the poor are increasingly marginalized and stigmatized, that is going to have very major consequences for the enjoyment of a whole range of human rights and not just for carrying out of the death penalty. We won't get rid of the death penalty by making the argument of its link to poverty until we start embracing much more comprehensively the deeper links between poverty and the violation of a wide range of human rights. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. So I, I now give the floor to um, Marianne Najjar, who is the advocate for the High Court in Kenya and, and currently serving as the Secretary of Justice and Constitutional Affairs. She's also currently the chairperson of the task, review, task Force on Review of the Mandatory Death Sentence under Section 204 of the Penal Code of Kenya. Ms. Nijar. Um, I'll give um, just a short background to, uh, to this task force um, because the um, professor has said that we don't need to, uh, to emphasize the link between death, you know, uh, poverty and the death penalty. So, but I'll just give uh, filing, the findings of this task force um, um, because in 2017, uh, the High Court in Kenya declared the mandatory uh, nature of the death sentence unconstitutional. 
uh, but uh, the court declared, uh, declared that um, it was not outlawing the death penalty, but the mandatory nature uh, of, that, uh, of, that, uh, of that sentence. So the High Court directed that, um, that uh, we, we look into necessary amendments, formulations, and enactment of statute law uh, to give effect uh, to the judgment, because in their reasoning, um, they, they quoted the, the Human Rights Council, uh, saying that uh, the Human Rights Council has recommended the abolition of the death sentence as a mandatory sentence. Um, it, they also uh, said that um, the, in, in making the death sentence mandatory, our penal code deprives the court of the court of the use of judicial discretion in a matter of life and death. And uh, so, according to the Supreme Court, such law can only be regarded as harsh, unjust, and unfair. And uh, they also uh, uh, encourage the courts uh, to ensure that in harding, in harding out sentences, uh, they must take into account the age of the offender, uh, whether the offender is, is a first offender or a repeat offender, whether the offender pleaded guilty, um, the character and record of the offender, uh, the commission of the offense in response to gender-based violence, the remorseness of the offender, uh, the possibility of reform and social readaptation of the offender, and any other factor that the court considers relevant. And in our, in our looking into this issue, we, we, we thought that poverty was one of uh, those other factors that the court uh, should um, have in mind, considering that when you look at the the, the, the cases that, you know, the offenses that fetch the death penalty in Kenya, we have about uh, 13 of them, and uh, only one of those is murder. The rest um, is uh, robbery with warrants, um, treason. The others uh, are found in the Kenya um, Defense Forces Act, uh, the ones spying, uh, communicating with the enemy, etc. So therefore, the task force um, was required then to, uh, to set up a legal framework uh, to deal with the sentence rehearing and to review the legislative framework. And we are also supposed to recommend a guide to death sentencing. And we also uh, are to come up with parameters of what ought to constitute uh, life imprisonment uh, in case we make recommendations that um, majority of these other cases um, then should fetch um, the life uh, sentence. And even in cases where uh, murder has been committed, um, as a task force, we are, we are categorizing um, this into four. Uh, we'll have what we are, you know, we are calling the first degree murder, um, which um, then, um, uh, fetches the life sentence, and we're coming up with the parameters of what will constitute that life sentence, and um, and where we have um, the first one is aggravated murder. We we'll, we'll recommend you are recommending that it will be life, but then the life will, will determine what that life means uh, with no parole. But um, the government itself, we also being guided by the fact that um, the government has in place now um, the national legal aid policy and the National Legal Aid Service. And um, one of the reasons why this uh, policy was adopted was uh, in our economic blueprint, we identified uh, the lack of access to justice as having a direct, a direct link to poverty and uh, acknowledged that economic growth alone is insufficient for achieving meaningful improvement in the quality of life of the poor, marginalized and vulnerable people and groups. And uh, therefore, the Vision 2030, uh, the economic blueprint, uh, recognizes that uh, there should be three pillars of development, um, economic, political, and social. And the political pillar in, in particular builds on various other aspects of human rights and the rule of law. And it recognizes that um, an efficient, accessible, timely, affordable legal and judicial uh, service encourages a culture of law-abiding citizenry and human rights protection, which are cornerstones uh, to social, political, and economic development. I would want to just quote a few um, statements from prisoners that um, we visited on death row. 
uh, because in our executing our terms of reference, um, we, we set out to collect um, demogra demographic data uh, on the death row population to obtain just a picture of their socioeconomic indicators. And um, we, we, we had a sample of 833 uh, persons on death row, uh, consisting of 789 men and 129 women. Um, and the majority of this that, uh, that we, we talked to, um, we, we sampled one, 165 files, um, 142 men and 25 female offenders. And out of those 167, only one man and one woman had attained um, uh, university education. The rest were certificate holders, primary school dropouts, um, and the majority of them state that um, they did not benefit from a trial, largely according to them, because of poverty, uh, poor education, and remote education. And they also did not benefit from any form of, of legal representation during their trials and appeals. And uh, according to them, this amounted to substantial uh, injustice. A majority of the, in, of the male in, inmates that, we, we, that were on death row were convicted of the crime of robbery with violence. And uh, majority of them, of course, bl uh, blamed poverty for their crimes. And as one inmate put it, uh, I'll quote him, I did not kill anyone. I only threatened her with a knife because I needed some money. I did not hurt her at all. I have an electrician certificate, but have not gotten a job since graduating from the, uh, from the polytechnic. I'm married with two children. I regret what I did. My wife has since returned to her parents. She has never visited me since I was condemned to death. And, and it goes on and on. Um, and I think, um, the, I think the most, um, the most touching were, were the, the women uh, inmates, um, because you know, according to them, uh, life is passing them by. Their children are growing up. They have nobody to, you know, to, to, look, up, to look after them. Uh, but like Professor says, I think the, the link between um, poverty and being on death row is real, especially uh, in my country. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, our third speaker and uh, panelist is uh, Kumi Naidu, who is the new Secretary General for Amnesty International. Uh, yesterday, I was introduced to him on a panel describing um, his organization as being, over the last 60, it was on torture, uh, and uh, I said that Amnesty was, over the last 60 years, the world's leading campaigning organization against torture. But one can say the same thing about Amnesty's record on the death penalty, too. Kumi. Thank you very much. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm speaking on behalf of Amnesty, as you've been told, which has this long history of activism around the death penalty. I welcome this opportunity today to take another step in the long road towards what we are determined should be the full abolition of the death penalty. Let me begin by recalling the story of Yusman Talabanu, who faced the prospect of a firing squad in Indonesia for approximately five years. It was his state-appointed lawyer who asked the judge to sentence Yusman to death and later failed to inform him of his right to appeal. Years later, with the support of Indonesia's Ministry of Law and Human Rights, Yusman and his new legal team were able to gather forensic evidence that led to his eventual release just over a year ago. Yusman's story is a cautionary tale about the toxic combination of the death penalty and poverty. He was lucky to survive, but it is a story that would never befall a rich person. The truth is that factors which have little to do with the crime itself can shape a person's experience of the criminal justice system and affect life and death decisions for them. I want to share four factors that significantly impact how a person will meet the fate in this lethal lottery of the death penalty. It is a quadruple burden of disadvantage that shows in sharp light the extent to which the death penalty is ultimately a scourge for the poor. The first factor. We know that those living in poverty are often unable to enjoy the right to receive competent and effective legal counsel at all stages in the proceedings. A critical safeguard, of course, in capital cases. But this challenge 
runs much deeper than simply access to a lawyer or the quality of the assistance. Amnesty has seen in numerous cases that less advantaged defendants were unable to enjoy the much needed support of forensic and medical experts to prepare the defense. Not many were as lucky as Yusman. The second factor, whether you live or die depends on who you are, where you come from, what you own, what language you speak, who you know, and how much of education you have. As Yusman's case shows, if you don't know how the system works, you can't call out your lawyer's failings. You can't appeal against your death sentence. A comprehensive study by the National Law University of Delhi shows how low literacy levels and marginalized social networks are important factors which influence people's ability to engage with the judicial process. So those from marginalized class, classes or religious communities are already at a critical disadvantage. In Saudi Arabia, only those able to influence the victim's relatives through power, money, kinship, or friendship seek in obtaining a pardon from the family and therefore avoid execution. The help of legal representatives alone is not enough. Migrant workers, on the other hand, lack these relationships and resources. Of the 104 cases in which pardons were granted between 2000 and 2008, foreign nationals accounted for only 10, despite the fact that they make up almost half of those who are execute, executed in Saudi Arabia. The third factor, the burdens of disadvantage multiply as those on death row with families living in poverty are much more vulnerable to exploitation. A Nigerian man contacted Amnesty in a state of great distress over the fate of his brother facing execution in another country. The defense team had demanded that he pay an exorbitant fee to secure a medical expert to assess his brother's mental disorder. The fourth and final factor. Nationality throws another element of chance into the mix. Whether a foreign person on death row lives or dies is heavily dependent on whether their country or nationality provides consular and legal assistance and how effective it is. And all too often, their fate comes down to political priorities of their government back home. Exactly one week ago, we received a message from a woman seeking help on behalf of a close family member recently sentenced to death in another country. Her words speak volumes about what she and her relatives have gone through, and I quote, Honestly, we have no idea what is going on. We were sent that little piece of information about the appeal, but nobody can really explain it. We have sent many emails around the world looking for answers. For two weeks, I asked how much time was left for the appeal and received conflicting answers. I also asked whether this is an actual appeal or just the application to appeal, and again, I received conflicting answers. We know nothing about the, about the procedures nor the appointed lawyer. We have not been able to contact anyone to represent this matter in court. Our embassy have not communicated with us except for that one email. They intend to wait until after the appeal is lost before they are willing to even try anything. But by then, it could be too late. Ladies and gentlemen, that the death penalty persists is a scourge on humanity. But we should not judge on the basis of the most powerful and their progress, but the welfare of the most vulnerable. There can be no clearer demand on our consciences than the fate of the poor on death row. It is time to end this lethal lottery. It is time for leadership and moral clarity. It is time to banish the death penalty, the ultimate cruel, inhuman, and degrading punishment to history forever. The struggle to ensure this continues. And I conclude in drawing your attention to those of you who want to continue to contribute in this fight of the holding of the Seventh World Congress Against the Death Penalty, which will take place in Brussels, Belgium, 
from the 27th of February to the 1st of March 2019 and invite you to attend that Congress and continue the struggle to end what is a brutal, inhumane form of punishment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kumi. So, our fourth and final panelist is Indumi Alatushani. Indumi was wrongfully convicted of murder in 1985. An all-white Memphis jury found him guilty and sentenced him to death, despite the testimony of several witness alibis who all insisted that Indumi was actually in St. Louis at the time of the crime. He spent 27 years in prison, 20 of them on death row, before his conviction was finally overturned. Since his release six years ago, he has been working as a community organizer for the Children's Defense Fund, where he works to dismantle the cradle to prison pipeline. It's an honor to have you with us, Indumi. First, uh, first I want to be, be, uh, begin by thanking uh, everybody here, uh, and particularly the people that's, uh, the General Assembly that's putting it on. Uh, uh, when I sit here and listen to everything that's being said and just kind of being here, uh, first off, I know that I'm really fortunate to be here. And, uh, but I'm reminded about the people that I left, uh, people that I consider to be my family, they're still sitting on death row right here in this country. And uh, uh, I wish it was some kind of way that not only them, but everybody around the world that's facing this, this unfortunate fate would be able to see what's actually happening here today because I'm sure it would give them hope. Uh, I was one of them people, like you said, uh, I mean, when you talk about poverty and the issues and uh, uh, the death penalty only being reserved for the poorest people, I was one of them people. Uh, I was one of them uh, uh, persons that uh, because I ain't have uh, first off, being a, a, a black man here in America, but also, too, uh, not having the means to, uh, to have the type of representation that everybody should have if they're facing a death penalty. I'm saying that they shouldn't be facing it at all, but if you're going to have the death penalty, you should certainly see that the people that's subject to it have every opportunity to come before the court or a tribunal, whatever they're going before, and prove uh, or have them approve, uh, uh, you know, whether or not they are uh, guilty of the crime, uh, but also, too, to be able to have some representation to bring forth some of the information that all of us know that people, uh, for whatever circumstances that may cause them to land on death row, that that happens in the instance. That don't say nothing about who this person was, who their family is. They don't say nothing about none of that. And I think that too often, I think that too often, uh, you know, the people that's voiceless is the ones that's subject to it. The whole time I sit in prison and I, everything that I know about the death penalty here in this country and where it's uh, exercised around the world, that the whole time I was there, I never met nobody or anybody that had money. Nobody, uh, I never met a rich person sitting on death row. I mean, all the, uh, all the people that I was locked up with were certainly people just like I was. They was not unlike me with respect to the resources that they had to bring the brand. I, uh, I want to say this here, too, that I know it's a lot of stuff going on this week up here at the UN, and I had an opportunity to hear some of what uh, uh, President Trump had to say and how he was telling you know, the United States being whatever he was trying to uh, promote. But the reality is that uh, in this country, when you're dealing with the, uh, the criminal justice system, especially somebody that looked like me, then uh, I'm saying to the people that's in this room, I'm saying that you guys are going to have to be the one to drag the United States into the future. Because as long as, as, long as you have the implementation of the death penalty, Certainly, innocent people are going to be, uh, be uh, subject to it. And like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm so fortunate that I'm able to be sitting here uh, at this table because had the state of Tennessee had it their way, I certainly wouldn't be sitting here. And when you talk about uh, uh, me growing up in St. Louis, the ironic thing about my situation is that I was born and raised in St. Louis. 
And I had never even been to the state of Tennessee until I was actually taken down there in handcuffs and shackles and put on trial for the crime that I was ultimately convicted of and sentenced to death and spent, uh, as uh, it was said, 20 years, a total of 27 years before uh, I was released June 1st of 2012. And it was only because of good people like the people sitting in this room that actually care about it and people, my family and friends and people that, uh, uh, that stood up that made it possible for me to be sitting here. And, and I would implore you guys that whatever you have, whatever opportunity that you have to uh, help eradicate the world from this particular punishment, I'm saying that it's incumbent on us that we actually do it. I, I say knowledge makes us responsible. Once we know something, we don't have no excuse. And I'm saying the very fact that I'm sitting here before you guys, and I'm telling you, but for good people, I wouldn't be here. I'm saying that uh, it's our responsibility to make sure that it don't happen to nobody else, whether guilty or innocent. I'm saying that I'm, I'm still baffled by the idea that you can, you can try to uh, kill people to tell people killing is wrong. Uh, it just don't work. And I know that some people, uh, with what's happening in the world, you uh, see people uh, uh, you know, committing heinous acts. And it tends to appeal to this thing inside of us to say that they deserve nothing more than death. But for some of them people, you giving them just, I mean, you take a terrorist, somebody that's trying to kill itself, I mean, killing them is, you ain't doing nothing to him. But what you doing is you telling the people in society that for those people that don't want to conform, that you can use this as a, uh, as a way to bend and break people and to conform into, you know, whatever, whatever it is that they trying to uh, promote. And I'm saying that, like I said, I think that uh, uh, I'm so honored to be here. And I think that, uh, uh, you know, like I said, I, I just wish it was some kind of way that the people that I know that are sitting in these places could actually see and know about all that's happening outside of here uh, to hopefully, like I said, uh, save their lives. To, help, to hopefully save their lives. I think it's, I, I think it's such an important issue. Uh, uh, like I said, I got people that are still sitting on death row that I consider to be my family, and I vowed to them that once I got out, that I was going to do everything that I possibly can to make sure that people know, uh, you know, that uh, they sitting where they sitting. I, I know you people, I don't know how many of you guys have never seen the inside of a jail cell or a prison cell, but for a lot of years, I was in a cell that I couldn't even stretch my arms out like this. It was only four feet wide and nine feet long. I was in there 23 hours of the day. Every time I came out, I was shackled and chained like some imaginary monster, shuffled from uh, one place to another. At one point, and this is just how, uh, this is just how cruel it is, at one point, I was in a cell. Right next door to me was a cell that they had converted to a shower. The people would come. We were only getting three showers a week at that time. The people would come and spend upwards of 15 minutes to shackle and chain me, to take me out of my cell and scoop me right from right here, literally right here, to give me a five-minute shower. It would cut the time on on the shower. In five minutes, the shower went off. And it would take them another upwards of 15 minutes to move me from here right back over here. And I'm saying that nobody, guilty or innocent, should be treated the way some people are being treated in this country. Uh, and I can imagine, I can hardly imagine, I should say, for places outside of this country, what people are being subjected to as they sit and wait for somebody to come and take them out of their cell and take them to whatever they're using to execute people. I'm saying that, I mean, just 
you know, as uh, uh, the uh, French uh, uh, minister said, the thing is that we have to demand abolition now. And we have to do it because as long as it's happening, not only are people going to be executed, but innocent people going to be executed. And that's the bottom line. Innocent people going to be executed. And I, I can't, uh, it's, uh, it's hard for me to imagine that any sensible person that's got any humanity in them would say that they support a punishment that they know is going to kill innocent people. That's hard for me to wrap my mind around. Like I said, I'm happy to be here. Thanks. There was me earlier saying don't feel the need to applaud, but that was very hard not to. Um, I now open the floor. I would like to ask participants to please be brief and also to introduce themselves when they take the floor. I, I note Stavros Lambrinidis through me. Is this working? I'm speaking on, on behalf of the European Union. Uh, civilized countries have an obligation not simply to punish guilty people, but also to ensure that they do not punish innocent people. That's what civilization is about. And that obligation, in the case of the death penalty, as Nduma mentioned, uh, is even more stark because that penalty is irreversible. And when the mistake is made, you cannot take it back. Every legal system, as everyone on the panel said, will make mistakes. The best one, the most perfect one, the, the, the one that is not corrupt, and the one that affords to its poorest people the perfect representation for free, will make mistakes. And the systems, the majority in the world, that do not have those safeguards will make even more mistakes. When you can buy yourself out of a police arrest or where you can buy yourself out of a conviction um, when uh, your uh, financial status, I like what you said, Andrew, at the beginning, uh, capital punishment is the punishment for those without capital. That brings a spotlight on the tremendous injustice. So whereas capital punishment must be abolished now and the European Union is leading the fight around the world on this precise goal, it is important that until this happens, we try to open the ears and the eyes of people, even those who support the death penalty, to the tremendous economic injustice around it. It is quite remarkable that the same people who complain about globalization and how very often it results in tremendous economic inequality, and they will do so rightfully, as Philip mentioned, may be people who will celebrate the death penalty as a uh, appropriate punishment without being able to see that poverty does not pick and choose where it uh, implements, as Kumi said, its, uh, its injustice. It just, uh, it just takes over everything, and it certainly does so in, in the death penalty. So, dear friends, um, Kumi, thank you for mentioning the, uh, the death penalty event in Brussels, indeed. It will be taking place end of February until the 1st of March. Uh, I am grateful for your call for people to participate. And I have to say as a final point, um, this is a remarkable topic, a very important one, uh, and a very important event here in the UN. Um, but I, 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 I almost constantly have this, the feeling when, when I participate in death penalty events that we are preaching to the converted. I don't know what the way out of this is, we seem to always recognize this, and then every panel seems to make the same mistake. Uh, not mistake, the same inability to bring more people in. Um, the, uh, Kenya does have the death penalty, so it's very important that, in fact, your rhetoric, what you are describing, uh, can reach the broader society. I would have loved to hear from you how it is that it is possible, you think, 
that the results of your study might resonate in the society, in a society that still retains the penalty, and whether or not there, it is possible to change hearts and minds through that kind of science, that kind of evidence, uh, whether or not more needs to be done to appeal to the hearts and minds of people, I just don't know. But um, I, ho I do hope that in Brussels in February we'll be able to uh, have in the room to be debate with us people from, uh, from uh, countries that, uh, that uh, uh, retain. And sadly, happily, uh, happily, they're much fewer than they ever before. But sadly, some of them proudly advocate the penalty. I would like to ask people who, who implement death penalty and are proud about it to tell me if in their countries they have any statistics about how many poor people are on death row. And if the statistics in their country are, as in other countries, uh, highlight uh, how poverty uh, gets you to death, uh, if they are proud about that too. I would like to be able to have a discussion about those, uh, those, uh, those facts with people who disagree with me and not just with those who do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Clevers. I note the uh, Deputy Foreign Minister of Ukraine. Thank you. Um, I represent Ukraine, the Deputy Foreign Minister. Today, Ukraine is a part of a death penalty free zone covering 47 European countries and over 800 to 20 million people. We carried out our, our last execution in 1997 and legally uh, forbid it, uh, prohibited death penalty in 2000. And it was the Council of Europe that played a key role in ensuring that Ukraine abolished capital punishment. However, today, in the context of our discussion, I would like to speak about the special circumstances and um, I would like to bring into our discussion the aspect uh, of uh, the women's rights. Unfortunately, women continue to earn considerably less than men. Women who make up half of our population still earn, on average, 16% less than men across the European Union, 25% less than men in Ukraine, and an average gap of 33% uh, remains to be closed worldwide. According to UN women, it will take about 170 years to close the gender pay gap around the world completely. Women are poorer, more hungry, and more discrimina discriminated against uh, the men. According to the UN report, turning promises into action gender equality in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the report's Authors also surveyed national laws around the world and found that women are more likely to face legalized discrimination. As a result, women in a, uh, are at a disadvantage from the very beginning in cases of death sentences. In fact, they are suffering from multiple discrimination, quite often being a woman, being a poor woman, being a poor uh, woman from a religious or ethnic minority. Not to mention that gender stereotypes, stigma, harmful and patriarchal cultural norms and gender-based violence has an adverse impact on the ability of women to get legal aid and her right to a fair trial in particular when they are facing death penalty. So I invite and I call upon the participants of this discussion to incorporate the women's situation uh, in general. Thank you. Hello? Is, is like, okay. uh. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I am Traore Udio from the National Commission of Human Rights of Côte d'Ivoire. I wish uh, to thank first all the panelists, uh, to thank the European Union and the United Nations for the efforts made to fight against uh, the death penalty. My country, Côte d'Ivoire, uh, has uh, uh, 
hosted in its territory, the Assembly General, in order to push a certain number of countries to definitely abolish the death penalty. And today, when we uh, when we talk about this, the countries that refuse to abolish the death penalty, there are two, there are two elements that need to be taken into account. Uh, there's the fact that these countries are not really democratic democracies. Uh, a way of uh, integrating this in their uh, legal framework uh, uh, is, is an element uh, to marginalize opponents. Also, we propose uh, that the fight against uh, the death penalty becomes part of a condition uh, to help uh, certain countries. I take the example, for instance, of uh, the European Union and Belarus. Uh, in order for countries to access the help of the European Union, why not put that as a condition? Thirdly, I think there's, uh, there's it is important to insist that all countries around the world who wish to participate in this evaluation on human rights, an element, the, that they should be uh, should be fighting against uh, the death penalty. I think that if we do that, uh, and we uh, we will uh, be able to convince certain countries who have not yet abolished the death penalty, it's a way of uh, making them aware. So it, there's also the thing of legal aid. Legal aid. Uh, there should be a, a fund for legal aid. Uh, uh, certain countries don't know about it. In Cote d'Ivoire, we uh, mobilize people so that the fund for legal aid is known by everyone and that people can have money to finance uh, all the women who are on death row or other people who unfortunately are in death row. So the challenge today uh, for us in terms of recommendations is that there should be an important uh, fund in order to assist all the vulnerable people like women, children, uh, poor people. Uh, so these are the propositions I wish to make and I wish to encourage the countries who are s still uh, hesitate to abolish the death penalty. Thank you. Je suis le directeur CPM, Together Against the Death Penalty, Ensemble Contre la Peine de Mort, who is the organizer of the World Congress Against the Death Penalty, which will take place in Brussels next February, as I already mentioned. Uh, I, will take the, I will take the opposite line on say, some popular beliefs in my words. Uh, first of all, about the public opinions. Uh, the public opinions are not unilaterally and irremediably in favor of the death penalty. Always public opinion uh, have follows, follows the decision of their government, follows the leadership of their government. Second argument is uh, the death penalty is an addition of discriminations. And the first discrimination that has been showed during the, by the panelists was that death penalty is an unfair, unfair sentence applied to poor people and the most vulnerable. The poverty links with death penalty are not even to prove anymore. This is obvious. Third argument is human being is not perfect. I think that everybody has agreed with that. And the failure of every Every justice system leads always to unfair trial and to a break in the rule of law. And, to, and it leads to have innocent people executed. In 2016, 60 people have been exonerated in the world. Killing to show that, that killing is wrong, is wrong. And make us only killers. The, de the death penalty do not protect societies to crimes, but even reinforce the idea that violence is the only answer to violence and the endless of, the, of this violence cycle. 
linked to the previous argument, death penalty is not deterrent. Death penalty do not prevent crimes. If I take the last world safest countries uh, ranked, upon the 21st safest countries in the world, only two are retentionist. 90% of the 20 of the 21st countries are abolitionist in law. I think it is important things to remind to everybody. Death penalty, last but not least, is a Damocles sword upon the prisoners. That's why we cannot be satisfied by moratorium situation. And I call all countries who follow a moratorium to, to move on toward abolition. And I, I, I welcome the great move from Burkina Faso in, the, uh, in 2017, uh, this year, 2018, and the, the project of constitutionalization of the abolition. There is a train to catch for many countries, the train of the abolition, because abolition is now universal. Abolition is a new universal fight, like before, the, before uh, slavery, fight against slavery or fight against torture. Please, take the train, catch the train, and that's why I invite all the UN members to come to the World Congress Against Death Penalty in February to dialogue, to discuss about the pot potential steps, because it is by, with the dialogue that we can move, and with the dialogue with countries who retain the death penalty. So everybody are invited for in, in Brussels to the Congress organized by my organization with the support of the government of Belgium, Switzerland, and the European Union. Thank you. Thank you, Raphael. The next three speakers will be Spain, gentleman who's been appealing, for, and then thirdly, the Holy See. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, let me bring to your attention uh, a case that uh, will remind you the case of Mr. Ola Tushani, the difference being that uh, it is still ongoing. Uh, by the way, I, have, uh, I should have introduced myself. I'm Marcos Gomez, I the Director General for United Nations and Human Rights at the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Pablo Ibar is a Spanish citizen who was accused of a triple murder in Florida in 1994. He could not afford an appropriate legal counsel. He was sentenced to the death penalty in 2000. He has spent now 18 years in the death row. Pablo Ibar would have been executed a long time ago, but there was a crowdfunding campaign in Spain Together with the support of my government, it allowed him to hire new lawyers to challenge this sentence, and he has gained the right to a retrial that is due uh, now in October. And it is as simple as that. Uh, as Professor Austin said, uh, in some countries, in some systems, you have the money, you can challenge the court, and you can survive. You don't have the money, you get executed. There is something fundamentally wrong about this state of affairs, but here we are preaching to the converted. I believe that our duty is to think hard on how to reach out to those governments and to those societies that still support the death penalty. And this is why I'm so grateful to the organizers of this event, because even, even those who believe against all evidence that the death penalty discourages crime. Even those who think that killing a criminal somehow compensates his or her victims. And even those who believe, again against all evidence, that justice systems are infallible and will never execute innocence, even all of them must acknowledge the fact that the application of the death penalty is disproportionately biased against the poor. So here we have an argument of fairness that we must use, and that I hope will sway some minds towards our ultimate goal, that is to abolish this unjust and cruel form of punishment. And you can count, of course, on, on Spain in order to, to achieve this goal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Gilmer. My name is Selwas from the Indonesian Mission. I have um, one question, but let me begin by um, congr congratulating the convener for organizing such an important 
debate on the relationship between the death penalty, poverty, and the right to legal representations at the sidelines of high level week of the UNGA. Indeed, these topics on the issue of poverty, the right to legal representations, or access to justice in general is also part of our national discourse in Indonesia. And we are, we are uh, proud that our vibrant society has also uh, making this as a central theme uh, with regards to the fulfillment of the sustainable development goals. We indeed um, put emphasis on the addressing of uh, poverty. And also, uh, I would like to make reference uh, to the um, insightful presentations by a representative of the Amnesty International. Congratulations, sir, for your uh, appointment as the new Secretary General of the uh, in Amnesty Internationals. Indeed, the, the case that you make reference about uh, the Usman case is actually an exemplary case where how a vibrant human rights um, group uh, society as well as the availability of legal framework for access to justice is actually working in Indonesia. And also it is actually the case where all levels of judicials have to um, make sure that attainment of basic um, access to justice is uh, being inserted. Uh, the Usman case is particularly um, uh, particularly to be noted because it is um, it's a case where there is an auto corrections by the Supreme Court to the to the um, district court to rectify um, the um, the legal facts and then uh, the legal um, circumstances as well. And my question is that uh, since there were some discussions about that migrants are prone to death penalty, um, how about the situations, for example, in um, where migrants are not, because before we even venture to, um, to protect um, migrants uh, from their vulnerability to death penalty, I think the first question would be how to ensure that migrants are protected indeed um, in situations of vulnerabilities um, from their basic access to um, their basic uh, basic access to uh, protections in foreign countries. I think that will be uh, one of the highlights of um, global discourse on um, um, migrations as well. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. The Holy See. Uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I am pleased to take part in this high-level side event on the death penalty, poverty, and the right to legal representation, and to add the voice of the Holy See to that of an increasing number of states supporting the UN's long-standing sponsorship for the abolition of the death penalty. I would like also to commend the organizers of this meeting, OHCHR, Italy, Brazil, Burkina Faso, France, and Timor-Leste, for the selected topic, ensure equal access to justice for all, especially for those affected by poverty, social and economic inequalities, as well as those who are facing possible execution. As is well known, in the last century, the Holy See has consistently sought the abolition of the death penalty, and in the last decades, this position has become more clearly articulated. In fact, 20 years ago, the issue was framed within the proper ethical context of defending the inviolable life, dignity of the human person and the role of the legitimate authority to defend in a just manner the common good of society. Considering the practical circumstances found in most states as a result of steady improvements in the organization of penal, the penal system, it appears evident nowadays that means others than the death penalty are sufficient to defend human lives against an aggressor and to protect public order and the safety of persons. For that reason, public authority must limit itself to such means because they better correspond to the concrete conditions of the common good and are more in conformity to the dignity of the human person. Pope Francis has further emphasized that the legislative and judicial practices of the state authority must always be guided by the primacy of, the hum of human life and the dignity of the human person. He has cautioned that there is the possibility of judicial error and the use made by totalitarian and dictatorial regimes 
as a means of suppressing political dissidents or of persecuting religious and cultural minorities. Thus, respect for the dignity of every human person and the common good are the two pillars on which the Holy See has developed its position. This is exactly what the new version of the Catechism of the Catholic Church on the death penalty highlights when it states that the Catholic Church teaches in the light of the gospel that the death penalty is inadmissible because it is an attack on the inviability and dignity of the person. And she works with determination for its abolition worldwide. The universal abolition of the death penalty would be a courageous reaffirmation of the belief that humankind can be successful in dealing with crime and of our refusal to succumb to despair before evil acts, offering the criminal a chance to reform. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, Sante Gidio has asked for the floor. Assistant Secretary General, Honorable Ministers and Distinguished Guests, I'm Mauro Garofalo from the International Relation of the Community of Sant'Egidio. I would like very, very briefly to congratulate uh, with the Italian government for the organization of this high level meeting, and as well as with, with uh, uh, the Burkina Faso government for the uh, recent abolition of the death penalty. We, we truly believe that a comprehensive approach in this advocacy to the abolition of the death penalty and to support the moratorium is crucial. This is why Sant'Egidio has carried out a number of activities, uh, both at grassroots level and official level. I would only briefly uh, underline that since 10 years, Sant'Egidio has provided a particular tool to, the, to support the moratorium at UN level, which is the, uh, national, the International Congress of Ministers of Justice that gathers uh, dozens of ministers of justice, both from retention in countries and abolitionist country for confidential meetings uh, in Italy. Uh, this year, again, we will celebrate this Congress in November to celebrate the National Day, uh, the International Day uh, Against the Death Penalty at the end of November, the 30th of November, with the support of the Italian Foreign Ministry, with the support of the, uh, the Switzerland government and the uh, Organisation Internationale della Francophonie. I think that this tool, which is uh, made of, of course, uh, public forum, public confrontation and institutional uh, um, meetings, is also made uh, of uh, confidential meeting in which abolitionist countries, retentionist countries, and de facto abolitionist country can confront themselves can discuss to to, um, to made up some strategies to uh, to support the, the the moratorium. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. If nobody from the floor wishes to say anything, I, I will ask the panelists to. Sorry, madam. Uh, thank you so much for this very encouraging and hopeful session. Uh, I am Birjan Enver and uh, I represent the Light Millennium Organization and we are associated with the DPI. Uh, this is really one of the most hopeful session and I congratulate uh, and I coin the distinguished representatives uh, for undertaking this uh, session. Um, all uh, is taken, uh, considered, my concern or question is, we see, despite all of this wonderful session and ideas and support and uh, projections towards the near future to total elimination of the death penalty, but we see on the other hand that uh, on the highest level, on the national level in different countries, it is rising, mentioning, uh, advocacy promotion of the death penalty. Um, that's kind of conflicting what it's been said and put out here. Therefore, uh, in this, I'd like to actually, if possible, uh, get Mr. Alston's opinion that what leads to this rising in some countries towards the death penalty and how the, even though Officially, it's not there yet, but it's kind of putting on the public agenda 
towards to encouraging people, supporting people, getting support by the people to approve that. So what should be done in between and what is your opinion on that? Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Ask the panelists now if they would like to add anything to what was said. Okay, last intervention from the floor. Am I heard? Okay. Um, thank you so much to the European Union and um, Italy for this event. My name is Naomi Epoki. I'm from Nigeria. Um, my question goes to Ndume. You were a victim at, the a at a very young age, and I was wondering if you had young people or other people standing up for you if any other if something could be done differently so my question is how could young people be involved in putting an end to exec executions because young people um, have the highest population right now in the world and i feel if we are able to harness the potentials of young people in advocating for such things we would have you know, more results coming out from other countries, seeing that we are the future of the world. So I really want to know from you um, what suggestions you have for young people since you were a victim at a young age, and what do you think would have been done differently at that time from your peers if they had a say? And if we are giving a say today as young people to, to make a difference in this area? Thank you. That's an excellent question, actually, and then it goes straight to what I wanted to do now is for the panelists to speak, but actually I hope maybe the other panelists might also have a go at answering that question, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the question. I would say, uh, uh, I would say first off, we need to educate young people, uh, you know, because I, I, I do work with young people across this country uh, and had the opportunity to uh, even speak to some outside this country, and I think that I think that is what I said earlier. Knowledge, knowledge compels us to do the right thing. That's not to say everybody will do it, but I think that when we educate young people uh, about not only the death penalty but all these other uh, uh, social economic uh, issues that surround the death penalty, uh, I think that I think that you know uh, they would be. You wouldn't have to tell them. You wouldn't have to give them, uh, uh, you know, somehow some instructions to uh, to go out and do something about it. I mean, obviously, you would want to. I mean, if you got something that you want them to be engaged in, you could tell them about that. But I'm such a strong believer in the idea that once we know something, once we once we have the information, and young people, I think too often that um, you know we don't give young people credit. Uh, you know, for the understanding once they know something. I think that, uh, uh, but I think education is the thing. I think that if you educate young people about what's happening around them, uh, they, you know, they would be compelled by their truth. Uh, I think that uh, certainly there's a lot of different ways that we can, you know, engage with young people, uh, like, uh, for me, I, I engaged with young people around art, for instance. While I was sitting on death row, I actually taught myself how to paint and, uh, and became an artist. And it was through my art in a lot of ways that my life was saved. And so one of the ways that I engage with young people is, like I said, uh, trying to educate them about this, uh, the particular issues that's happening, that's happening around them. Uh, and uh, you know, do it through art. I mean, uh, uh, I think it's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of ways, specific ways that you could uh, engage with them. But I think the most important thing is not only for young people, but for everybody alike, is educate them about what's actually happening around them when it comes to this issue of the death penalty. Uh, because it ain't. I mean, you ain't got to be a rocket scientist, particularly uh, those people coming from these marginalized communities. They living with it every day. And so uh, uh, I think the thing that I would say to you and everybody here, go out and engage and talk to young people about, uh, about the issue. And, uh, and I, I have to believe that they're going to be compelled by that truth. Yeah. Thank you, Ndumi. Philip, any final words from you? 
thanks, Andrew. Just to say, I think to point to the point that uh, Ndume made about the um, horrors or the inhumanity of a lot of criminal justice systems, uh, it's not just the uh, death row phenomenon. Uh, I've visited uh, hundreds of prisoners on death row uh, around the world uh, in my capacity as special rapporteur. And one of the things that one sees is that the inhumanity of the death penalty actually then tends to justify all of the other indignities that are inflicted, certainly upon those who are convicted of capital crimes, but more generally so the entire criminal justice system is uh, degraded. Uh, two other very quick points. One is we haven't really talked on this panel about legal representation at all. Uh, but it's very important, I think, to note the general trajectory of that right. Uh, in so many countries, there have been enormous reductions in the sort of funding that is made available by governments uh, and certainly others uh, for legal representation, not just for the death penalty, but for other extremely serious crimes. Uh, and this is, again, an enormous step away so the final message for me is that uh, to the extent that we're focusing on poverty, we absolutely need to embrace the concept of economic and social rights because without that, poverty doesn't have the same stigma attached to it and we're never going to really be able to persuade people that because poverty itself is a travesty of justice, uh, it's made doubly bad if it's then linked to the death penalty. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed. Um, I'll speak to um, somebody raised an issue that um, where uh, the, the death penalty still exists, the issue of government-led um, initiatives. Um, in Kenya, the government is way ahead of its people in the sense <laughs> that um, since 1987, um, we've had a moratorium on the death, uh, you know, on the death penalty, uh, but the Office of the High Commissioner in Nairobi uh, carried out a survey um, in conjunction with with the Department of Justice, and uh, they were very shocked that majority, um, about 58 percent of the people, wanted more offences uh, to fetch the death penalty in Kenya, and I think it's because. Um, um, the government hasn't um, put anyone to death, and uh, we have more violent uh, crimes, including terrorism. Um, so in Kenya, the government is ahead of its, uh, of its population. Uh, but I think also recognizing this issue of um, uh, what legal aid means, um, in Kenya we have um, a definition uh, of access to justice as the ability of the people, particularly from poor and disadvantaged groups to seek and obtain a remedy through formal or informal justice systems uh, in accordance with uh, human rights principles and standards. And therefore, this includes um, getting uh, legal advice and awareness, legal representation and assistance, uh, provision of legal information and law-related education, and uh, uh, undertaking law reform and advocacy on behalf of the community. Thank you. I want to address my comments to Ndume. Uh, yesterday, I had the honor of representing civil society at the Mandela Peace Summit. And I just want to say to you that, like Mandela, you spend 27 years in prison. Like Mandela, you come out with such a sense of dignity, such a sense of purpose. And I want to say thank you. Thank you very, very much uh, for making yourself available to be a voice. To Raphael and the coalition, which in English is together against the death penalty. I'll try not to say it in French because I might butcher the French language in the process. I would suggest to you, my brother, very humbly, let's invite Ndume to be the chief guest of honor at this World Congress Against Death Penalty next year in Belgium, and let's honor him there. Let me just say that I think the key issue here is the issue 
of how do we work with the general public. And I think you, Rafael, did a good job of listing a range of very simple reasons that communicate better than some of the ways we sometimes try to approach how we communicate to the general public in somewhat too legalistic uh, language and so on. I think we need to find more popular ways to talk about this so that, for example, in Kenya, or in South Africa, by the way, South Africa, uh, as uh, Philip said, you know, that was one of the first decisions that the Constitutional Court led on. But probably, if you take public opinion, it's not necessarily, uh, the, it's not necess I wouldn't give it as a given that 50% of the people or more uh, actually supports the decision of the Constitutional Court. And so I think we still have, and we must be honest with ourselves, we still have a lot of work to do to educate our global public. Um, but the important thing is that the, when leadership of governments opportunistically make uh, uh, statements, particularly leadership of political parties seeking to get elected, offer this as some solution, that is what contaminates the public debate, including some of the most uh, powerful politicians in the world, including in the very country that we find ourselves in at the moment. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, all fellow, fellow panelists, and indeed the, the co-sponsors, and, and everyone who spoke today. This has been an extremely fruitful discussion. People always say that at the end of meetings, um, often not very honestly. This one, however, really truly was a, a fruitful discussion. Um, and I think, obviously, the link was pretty clear to everybody between poverty and the death penalty, but um, it's utterly irrefutable, and I suppose nothing more than this shows the utter iniquity and inequity of the death penalty. And we will be taking this forward. Uh, we have the, the World Day, the Day Against the Death Penalty on the 10th of October, throughout the rest of this year, the 70th anniversary of the Null Declaration, and then this meeting in Brussels, which Raphael and Kumi have been speaking about. Of course, I mean, as I said, while we recognize this, um, Stavros Lambrinidis was quite right to draw attention to the fact that death penalty events tend to preach to the converted, although it's very good to have people, even one or two, who, who aren't converted, but still, we need to get beyond that conundrum, how, how to get it beyond our, it's so obvious to us. Because at this time, we are, I mentioned positive trends at the, at the beginning, but we are still witnessing a movement in some countries for increasing death penalty for for drug offences and indeed terrorism. And there are some countries that are now talking about it where they hadn't been doing so before. Anyway, we will be putting up, on, we'll be doing a detailed summary of this event and we'll be putting up on our website. OHCHR will be the, under the New York office for those who want it. It'll take a few days. And it will feature strongly the extraordinary testimony of Ndumi. I, I've never said this before. I, I think it was one of the most powerful interventions I've seen heard in my life. And, and I'm glad Kumi also believes that this should be showcased and Ndumi's incredibly compelling evidence and testimony needs to be heard by many others. So a big thank you to everybody. Uh, we'll be taking this forward. There's a lot more to do, as a number of you have pointed out. So thank you. <laughs>